First, I just want to say uh, thank you for coming tonight to our community conversations on health care. And I hope you had an opportunity to get into the room next door and hear more about virtual care, public health, primary health care, emergency health services, uh, pharma care, continu and continuing care, the whole list, uh, virtual care, Nova Scotia. Um, and now we'll be moving on to the question and answer portion of the evening. My name is Nancy mcconnell Maxner. I work with Nova Scotia Health, and I'll be the moderator for tonight. I uh, just wanted to mention about the, again, for the process tonight, when you came in, two, I guess two things to start with, the, the uh, cards that you were given. If you have a card and you want to fill it out and ask the question yourself, that's great. If you don't want to ask it, you can give it to the desk out here or hand it to me and we'll read it on your behalf. I also want to mention that this portion of the event will be recorded and will be available to view for those that haven't attended tonight or if you want to watch it again, you can do that as well. Give people a few more seconds to get settled in. Okay, so I'd now like to welcome Honorable uh, Timothy H Hallman, Hallman, sorry, uh, Minister of Environment and Climate Change in the MLA for uh, Dartmouth East to do an official welcome. Thank you very much, Nancy. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we're in Mi'kma'ki, the traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Uh, and also, I want to acknowledge the, uh, the contribution, the 400-year contribution of uh, African Nova Scotians to the history and culture of our beautiful province of, of Nova Scotia. Uh, I think Nancy said it best, great and engaging conversations. And that's one of the outcomes here um, I know these two exceptional health leaders hope to achieve with you uh, this evening. Um, uh, I have the honour of serving as the MLA for Dartmouth East and also Nova Scotia's Minister of Environment and Climate Change, but also I have the responsibility of serving as the Chair of the Treasury Board for the province. And I get to see every week um, the great investments that, uh, that are taking place in Nova Scotia Health under the great stewardship of uh, these two exceptional health leaders and other health leaders that you have here in the room. So I can test testify that uh, you, will, um, you will be working and listening to and learning from uh, two of the very best. Uh, so I'd like to introduce uh, the Deputy Minister of uh, the Department of Health and Wellness, uh, Deputy Janine Legasse. And I'd like to introduce also the Interim CEO of Nova Scotia Health, Karen Oldfield. So it is my desire, it's my hope that you have a great conversation tonight. Uh, our government is, is working as hard as we can every day uh, to ensure uh, the modernization of our healthcare system. And uh, I have no doubt that you'll have a great conversation this evening with uh, these two great healthcare leaders. So Deputy, over to you. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Hallman. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming this evening. I think this is one of the largest crowds that we've had so far, so this is fantastic. Um, I think I just wanted to start a bit by saying why we're here tonight. And over the last couple of months, myself and Karen and uh, Minister Michelle Thompson, the Minister of Health and Wellness, she was unable to be with us here tonight. But we started talking about, um, all. we talk all the time about the issues that are facing our health system. And we know that many of you probably don't have a primary care provider and that many of you may have waited a very long time for surgery or are waiting for surgery. And uh, we are looking for more and more healthcare workers. There are just so many issues that are facing our system. And we wanted to come out and hear from you. Because back in September of 2021, when the government was first elected and Minister Thompson was first appointed as minister, uh, Karen and myself, the Minister and the Premier, and our other health leadership team colleagues, Dr. Kevin Orrell and Janet Davidson, the Administrator of Nova Scotia Health, set out on a tour of the province um, to meet with healthcare workers. So we covered all points from Niels Harbour to Yarmouth in a, in a week and met with many healthcare workers, frontline healthcare workers, administrators, physicians, nurses, physiotherapists, all across. And we listened to what their challenges were in the system, and we also listened to their solutions. And coming from that tour, we took all of that information and uh, worked for a number of months and came out with our strategic plan for the healthcare system, which is Action for Health. And Action for Health is really our roadmap to transforming into a world-class health system. 
that we're at a point here in Nova Scotia where tinkering around the edges will not get us there anymore. We need real change within the system. And that's what we've started to do through Action for Health. There are six solutions that are presented in the plan. You can access it all online. And also online with the plan is an accountability dashboard. It tells you where we are in achieving the plan and it also gives you statistics each day on how the system is performing that particular day, week or month. So having done that, now we were talking with each other and we said, we really want to hear now what community is feeling, what your challenges are, what solutions you see, things you think we should have our eye on as we move forward in implementing action for health. So really, time is now. Uh, we want to be bold and we want to uh, create a much better system so that you can have the care that you need and deserve. So the format for tonight is question and answer, but really we want to have a conversation with you and that we're, we're really interested to hear uh, what you have to say. I think with that, I'll turn it over to Karen. Great. Thanks, Janine. And um, again, this is one of our larger crowds, so it's nice to uh, have you all here. Um, I'm actually from Dartmouth, so it's um, very important to me personally that my family members who still live here and my husband's family members who live in Dartmouth are properly taken care of and have access to the care that they need. My mother-in-law's in her 90s and um, lives still on her own, luckily enough. And um, so I, I, I empathize, sympathize, and, and are, are, you know, as Janine says, we just, we're looking every which way under every rock to uh, find the solutions that we need. So solution's a key word here tonight. Um, you know, we've done, I think, nine or 10 of these now. We have 18 before Christmas. So we're on the road, um, and they're mostly at night. Mostly, they're either six to eight or seven to nine. And uh, we've got two road trips ahead that are gonna be fairly daunting. And so um, the themes, they're, they're similar, and yet uh, outside of the city, it's a little different. So, you know, we're, we're, we're really, um, listening, but I would just encourage folks who, who are, are sitting around their, you know, dinner table or, or having coffee with friends saying, like, why don't they do that? Or why don't they think of this? Or why do they do that? Well, were they? And I really want to hear that. And so, you know, we did the same thing with the healthcare workers. It was very, very um, enlightening. So on that score, I would just like to ask for a show of hands in the room of, of people who are healthcare workers who are working in our system currently. And I know there's quite a few here. So you can just look around, folks, and you'll see that there are a goodly number, and I, I I always like to start by saying thank you. And I would like to remind people that just three years ago, seems like a lot longer, almost three years ago, at the front end of the pandemic, you know, around the world, people were beating pots for healthcare workers. We were, they had Tim Hortons coffee uh, gift cards, had um, banners being hung off bridges to our healthcare heroes. And I don't know when it all changed, but it changed. And now, you know, our healthcare workers are at the front end of, of the brunt of a lot of frustration, exasperation, and so forth. So I would just, in the words of Bonnie Henry, ask you to be patient and be kind to our healthcare workers because they still need our support. So to those in the room, I really appreciate you coming. And I appreciate the work that you do for us every day. So thank you. And, and I assure you, they want to help and want to find the solutions just as much as we all do. And so there may be a couple that we call upon tonight because they know a whole lot more about a particular um, aspect of the system that, uh, than we do. And so with that, um, let's go to questions. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so I just wanted to kind of go over a little bit again around the format for tonight. 
where we will be doing questions and answers. We'll take some that have been submitted previously, so some were uh, sent in ahead of time, and we'll read those, and we will also kind of alternate between audience questions and submitted questions so that we have an opportunity to hear from you and also from those that may or may not be in attendance at submitted questions. I will assure you, though, that uh, all questions have the, will be answered at some way, shape, or form. So if at the end of the evening we've got a million questions and we can't get to them all, I would ask you to write them on your card with your contact information. So a phone number, an email, whatever way you need to be contacted if we don't get to your question, and someone will follow up with you. So questions will be answered. So if you don't get to ask them live in the forum tonight, I just want to make sure you know that they, you will be responded to and you'll hear back. Um, I also just, um, it, some questions that might have been submitted might have been clumped together, so it might be part of your question and someone else's as well. So I just also wanted to mention that. Um, and also, when you're putting your hand up, I always apologize because I know, I, you know you're not supposed to point, but I kind of have to do the pointing to where you are. So I'll try to, if you've got a question you want to ask, just put your hand up and I will point to you and we'll, we've got runners with microphones, you won't have to get up. We have uh, people that will take the mic to you, okay? So everybody cool with that? So we're actually going to start tonight with some submitted questions just to kind of get everybody warmed up and the panel warmed up and um, just to get things started. And the first question is a submitted question and it is, what is the actual root of the doctor shortage problem and what is being done about it? The root of the, of the doctor shortage problem. Well, let me start, and then we can, you can jump in, Janine, and we do have a couple of doctors here, so they may like to actually speak to it from their own perspective. One of the things that we're finding is that newly minted grads like to work in different ways. Uh, there was another question submitted about collaborative practice, and it is absolutely the case that many of our um, New docs like to work in that kind of a team environment with um, different team members who can bring different things to the table and do different parts of, of uh, keeping our people healthy and well. So that's one fact. A second fact is that um, I, I don't know who in the room would have, uh, like my, my doctor's been my doctor now for, I, I'm thinking about 30 years. And my particular doctor has a patient roster of well over 3,000 people. So doctors now don't necessarily take on the same number of patients. So as we have retiring physicians, the, the basically the math is it's almost three to one. So we pretty much need to recruit three new docs to replace a retiring doc. This is a, it's a bit of a generality, so, you know, there's always exceptions, but just in rough, you know, just to get your head around that, three to one. And so that means we've got a lot more doctors that we need to recruit. And at the same time, with our perfect storm, we have a significant increase in the population of Nova Scotia. So it's kind of going, you know, the bridge is, or the gap is getting wider, it's not narrowing. And so uh, that means that, our, that every effort has to be on the table and every effort has to be pursued to, to make up for that shortfall. So I'm gonna start there, you can add Janine, and then as I say, Mar Maria's here and Christy's here, and if they wanna add, they can as well. Yeah, no, and I, I think that just a bit of a variation on the theme is of how physicians are working now is different. So the collaborative practice is one aspect, but also a lot of them don't want to do a full-time office practice, that they like to do a variety of things, right? And I think we can all think about that in our own work life, right? That if you're doing the same thing all the time, that sometimes you want to move into something else. So a lot of them like to do some time in long-term care. They like to do time in the emergency department. They, so it's not full-time practice. So as Karen said, that leads us to the issue of not being able to really replace one for one. Um, they also like to work with different payment models. So we're working on that as well. We've got a, a pilot project related to a particular payment model. 
Um, majority of physicians used to work on a fee-for-service model. A number of them now work on contractual or salary basis or on a blended cap model, it's called, where you get some salary, some fee-for-service. So there's just a number of things that are changing in how people are working and how we remunerate them. And just it's just very, very different than it was years ago. I think the last thing I would raise is training. And so we know too that um, you know the best way to try to get and keep people is to often train them close to home. So we're looking at a lot of different training opportunities as well, like how we train, how we number of people we put through medical school, the number of residency seats we have, whether they're urban or rural. So there's just a lot of factors that go into it. But we're trying a lot of different avenues to get people and to keep them here. Yep, thanks. It, did we miss anything, Maria or Christy, that you wanted? That's okay, Maria has. So, this is Dr. Maria Alexiadis. Maria is a family <laughs> practice physician. Come on down, Maria. John's That's it. She's, John's chasing you, but come on down and um, go ahead. I hate talking my back to people, so that's why I came up front, not because I'm a, I have an ego that I need to be in the top in the front. Um, thank you. Actually, what you said was exactly right. So you're listening even to the physicians talking to you because I think there's a lot of physicians in this province who are doing excellent work. COVID has really made them tired, and a lot of them now are close to retirement. And so that is that statistic about the three to one because there's practices that are larger. The other thing, which is a good thing to have, is medicine has progressed so much that those complex patients we actually stay alive longer, which is great. <laughs> but it takes a little longer to organize and to coordinate that care. So sometimes the actual burden of keeping people healthy also plays a part in having not enough doctors to do the work. The other piece, and this is something that happened when I was in medical school, so I've been a doctor for 33 years plus. There was a study that was done that said, oh no, we have to stop graduating doctors. We're going to have too many doctors in the next 20 years. So we're now trying to catch up. We're playing catch up to that wrong study. <laughs> so I mean, things that have been happening, our medical schools are increasing, the number of, of students coming through that happened a few years ago, and now we're having 10 more new family medicine spots. So we know that we need to graduate more physicians. I'd love to do it, but I'm, I'm menopausal, can't have a baby, <laughs> takes too long to have a baby, so I can't or do, develop a doctor, so I can't do that. But we're trying to recruit doctors. But the other piece is, you'll hear us talk about transforming the system. And part of that is looking at how do we deliver care, so it's not just a doctor, it's not just a nurse, not an MP. There are other people who can do the job with us, partner with us to do the job. So yes, we do nurses, yes, we do MPs, but we have pharmacists, we have physiotherapists, occupational therapists, we have social workers, mental health workers, emergency department, and emergency EHS workers. So, the fact is we're transforming the system so we know there's enough health and health work to be spread around and that's what we're trying to do. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Thanks Maria. Maria. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like that answered a whole bunch of other questions that were submitted so I could just skip ahead. Um, I, I also feel the need to mention about the masks when we're up here. Sorry, I'm dropping things up here all over the place. Oh. Um, that when we're on the microphones, um, it's hard to hear without the ma with the masks on. So. That's why we're sitting back far enough and why we're taking the masks off, so just so that people know that in the audience. Um, I'm going to read another question from the submitted questions um, that, that were answered at this point. And just, is there a functional plan going forward to restore health care? <laughs> yes. <laughs> the, um, well, not to be facetious, but Janine did talk about um, Action for Health. And Action for Health has six pillars that basically set out where we're focused. Uh, that will include where the dollars are most uh, prioritized. And as Janine mentioned as well, we are trying very hard to be accountable to Nova Scotia, to ourselves and to Nova Scotians. And uh, you can see the dashboard. Um, in living color if you wanted to have a look on your computer and so I think this is the first time in I'm gonna say at least 25 years but you probably know the number exactly Janine where where we've had a, a strategic plan in this province that has set out where we need to go and how we're gonna get there 
And um, a lot of the input has come from the system itself, from our healthcare workers who are on the front line and know what the problems are and what needs to get fixed. So yes, we do. Sometimes I get caught up in the listening and uh, forget that I'm supposed to be moderating and asking questions as, and taking from the audience. Um, there's a couple more of these submitted questions that I think we really, um, I, I feel a little like we're putting you on the hot seat here, so I am going to read these submitted ones. So I'd like to know the reasons the doctors are leaving Nova Scotia. Is it because they view the Nova Scotia taxation unfair? Is it because they think the compensation is too low? I feel the government has not shared enough information with the public. Oh, Christy wants to do this. Um, I mean, I, I can't speak for a doctor because I don't really know, but uh, I think taxation's high anyway, so. Um, however, I, I don't think that's why. Thank you. Hi, everybody. This Hi. is Dr. Christy Bassi. Thank you, Cameron. And Christy is a hospitalist. She works in Central Zone, uh, so she is a physician leader in our system. And she has 13 years experience and uh, is learning every day in her role as um, medical director of Central Zone. Yes, I am, which is a fairly new role for me. So as a clinician, I'm from Newfoundland and Labrador. I trained at Memorial and I've been in, in um, Nova Scotia since my residency. I did my family medicine residency here. And I'm one of those physicians who was trained here and decided to stay here um, in no small part because of the experience I had in my training. So I just wanna, all these questions are tied together when it comes to recruitment of physicians and retention. So I think that's really important, Maria, what you just commented on with training. And also when you come through training as a physician now, you come through um, different experiences with collaborative practices as well in the hospital system where I work is very important for the team, physiotherapy, social work, recreation therapy, respiration therapy, you know, pharmacy, nursing, LPNs, RNs, right? You're all part of the team. So then it's obviously difficult um, to sort of leave that environment in your training and go into a solo practice. Um, the other thing too, outside of solo practice, and, and w people just don't tend to want to take on that type of practice anymore, um, because of the natural evolution that's happened, we have many more women as well, like myself, going into medicine. The balance of, of raising your family for those who have decided to have family and balancing it. Um, and sort of the days of, you know, the generations when I would have grown up, my dad is not at all in medicine in rural Newfoundland, um, of being sort of outside of the home with having a partner who was at home and able to raise kids. Like that's not, um, that's not the usual so much anymore. Um, so it's more, it's, a, it's very complicated, it's multifactorial. Then outside of the actual uh, recruitment, like Maria mentioned, types of practices, education, we also need to think about uh, outside of funding. Funding's important. We all know that funding's important. We know there are certain areas of the country that fund physicians, NPs, PAs, and others differently than here in Nova Scotia, but it's not all about the funding. It's about making uh, Nova Scotia attractive, right, for a variety of reasons. And then, of course, I can't help but speak about the evolution we still need to undertake in our healthcare system to become a magnet for providers around things like technology. And we in Nova Scotia to date haven't kept up uh, with, with advancements in technology to be able to provide the best healthcare we can to our patients in this province. We've not been able to evolve to accomplish that yet. We know that's in the Action for Health, and Janine, I've heard you speak about that, and Karen as well, a number of times. But I think there's much more um, that we could focus on to make Nova Scotia attractive as a province to remain in and want to practice, whether you're a physician or a nurse, or a nurse practitioner, clinical associate, whether you're in really medicine at all or in an allied health profession. There's much more than only the funding and only the taxation that would make Nova Scotia attractive to physicians. I hope that helps. Yeah, I think so. And um, I, I would just add that that's even more so when it comes to um, internationally, those physicians who are, are educated from outside of um, Nova Scotia or Canada and moving, being recruited to Nova Scotia. We have a lot of work to do uh, and communities have a lot of work to do and to help us to not just land the physician, but also make the physician's family uh, feel supported as well. 
So that ties very directly to immigration and some of the things that we need to do to uh, make sure that people are feel, feel welcome and have the supports that they need to be successful here in our province. So many, many things tied together. Um, but just back on the question, a lot of times, we'll do exit interviews with physicians when they do choose to leave, and frankly, many of the reasons are just personal. They, they perhaps came from another province, their family is somewhere else, they, they just make a personal decision to, to leave. So we have to respect that too. Okay, I'm going to read one more submitted question, and then I'm going to go to the audience. So if you have a question in your mind, uh, you know, that, that's coming. So the next one is around the QE new build. So what are the plans for the new build? What's the completion date for Bayers Lake facility? And where are you going to get the staff for these facilities? Well, that's the question. <laughs> that's the question. It's not about finishing. It's about staffing. Um, so the second part, Bayers Lake, I don't know if you've been in... Uh, you know, shopping at Bears Lake for Christmas season, but uh, it's well underway. It's actually on time, a tiny bit ahead of schedule, and and is slated to open, I think, uh, later in 2024. So it's not really that long away. So that's one. Um, the QE2 rebuild, I, I sent a note to uh, staff two weeks ago or three weeks ago that said stay tuned, and I would simply say, Stay tuned. I think uh, something will be coming fairly imminently around that. And um, I think that's something that we'll all be pretty excited to, uh, you know, hear and understand what's, what's, what the plan is. And on the third part of the question, um, the staffing. So we've had three questions already on, around doctors. Uh, we could say many of the same things with respect to other healthcare workers, whether they are RNs, LPNs, CCAs, OTs, PTs, RTs, and, and uh, you know, pharmacists. And I, I do like to say that while many times we may just refer to physicians and nurses, it's, it really is the gamut. There are so many different uh, professionals that make the system work, and many of them are actively being recruited. So I think you would know that we, um, the government did establish an office of, uh, of uh, healthcare recruiting. So um, th that it, they are in the market every week. Uh, they're at trade fairs, recruiting fairs. They're around our province. They're around Atlantic Canada. Um, you know, anywhere where we think it's important and strategic to be recruiting various kinds of uh, healthcare workers. Um, we have pretty advanced digital platforms as well where we can have good outreach, but you can also be our recruiters because you know you, you have family, you have friends, you may know of, of uh, students who are studying away who want to come home. Uh, but there's any number of ways that we find people and you know, just these tours, it's, I've found it, you know, I'll just give you a couple of small anecdotes, but they're really meaningful. So in the summer, um, uh, I was at Fisherman's Memorial at some point in August, and um, we were having a little tour and wanted to have a picture taken, and I walked down the hall and uh, th there was an RN, could you please take our picture? And he said, sure. So on his um, name tag, it was Jojo, RN and uh, he was um, from India and I asked him uh, how long he had been here and 10 years he studied at the University of Kerala and I asked him how difficult or not it had been for him to to uh, be licensed here in Nova Scotia he said when he came 10 years ago it was not difficult but he had 10 friends in Bridgewater who were having the dickens of a time trying to get licensed now. So, so I said, write, write me, give me your email. So he did that. The next day he received a call from our office and he is now one of our navigators. He's still nursing, but in his extra time, uh, he's helping us to not just work with those 10, but they come from an, uh, 
uh, his, he and his colleagues, uh, former classmates, they're all in a class in the University of Kerala. They all came to Canada. They could be in different provinces, but they're known to each other. So just having one person that can crack it, uh, you know, open a door and crack the nut is really, really helpful. And similarly, uh, last week, actually, we were in, um, we were in Cherrybrook, and uh, there was a lovely woman, Eunice, I'm sorry, I won't get her last name uh, correct, but she, she's, she came to Canada from Nigeria. And she came to see me after the session and she said, listen, I'm sitting on 40 CVs, classmates, that want to emigrate, immigrate to Canada. And so, you know, we had her in the office on Monday and uh, sure enough, you know, the 40 CVs have arrived. And now we go through and we see who could be licensed quickly and, and, and what that process is. So I just share those two anecdotes because uh, this is how it happens. It, it's, you know, we do need, I would argue we need plane loads for the next little while of, of, of uh, healthcare workers and in particular RNs and LPNs. However, if we can bring a group of people who have known each other for a period of time, then they're more likely to stay together, to help each other, to support each other. So, you know, it happens many different ways, and, um, and each of you can help us too. So I, I just ask you to remember that, and if you know of people, we want to know. Thank you. So I think now we'll go to audience members, and I know when I first said it, I saw a hand up in the back over here, is that, did you already, yeah. So I think I saw your hand up before, <laughs> when I was first starting, so I'll go to you first. And if you want, yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I imagine there's a few other seniors here. It's been my experience, um, both in doctors, primary care, and also in specialists, that there is a 10 minute rule. You've got 10 minutes to tell your story and then you're out of there. And that's a problem for seniors who have multifaceted problems. And there's no way in the world anybody's going to do a differential diagnosis in 10 minutes. So can't we have somebody like an RN who meets with this patient before she sees the doctor? And instead of the doctor having to drag all of this out of a patient and try and figure out what the problem is with somebody who has 15 different symptoms, it should be much more efficient to have somebody collate those, those uh, problems and present uh, a reviewed or refined report to the physician so that the 10 minutes, if that's what we have to deal with, can be useful. Yes, right, is the, yes, the yes. short answer to that. Yes, with an exclamation yes. mark for me. And I think to um, Dr. Maria Alexiadis, who was up here earlier, she, in addition to her work in primary care in Central Zone, she's leading our primary care uh, working group under Action for Health and the transformation work. And I know that those are a lot of things that they're looking at, right? Like at the different models of care and how in different, and it's also different, it's, it's seniors, it's also communities. It, there's a whole different, there's a whole bunch of differences, right? That we need to start thinking about in a, dip, in a new and, and different way. So work is absolutely underway in our primary care transformation work. and. Like you said, for, for us, it is, it is yes, that absolutely it's the collaborative care model where you have more providers there and that people get to see who they need to see when they need to see them at the right time. I'll, I'll maybe give you a couple of um, examples and some additional th uh, things to think about there too. So we can, we've proven some of this out very conclusively uh, and I'll just give you one example. In about this time last year, we worked with um, folks at the um, Faculty of Medicine at Dalhousie. So Dalhousie and NSH run a number of clinics around Nova Scotia in, in, uh, in partnership with each other. And I'm thinking off the top of the Dalhousie Family Medicine Clinic. Some of you may have heard of it. And we believed intuitively that um, the clinic had more capacity to take on more patients from the list. And so 
we worked out a project where uh, a team went in. They went in for four days, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And the purpose was to look at the scope of the different professionals in the practice and to make sure that, you know, the, the physician's time was best spent, the nurse practitioner's time was best spent, the administrative assistant's time was best spent, etc. So on, uh, so they went in Thursday, Friday. Uh, we also had the team included um, one or two industrial engineers as well. We we're looking for process improvements and so forth. So Friday night, uh, my team lead calls and says, Karen, we, we can take 2,500 people off the list without even blinking. By Sunday, they called to say, we can take 3,500 people off the list, and we think we found uh, an improved way to help residents train and to have them more practice ready when they go out on their own to commence their own practice. So um, we did all of that, and that, that you know, we put all of we put the things in place that had to be put in place to make that happen. And uh, one of the things we learned, and I guess this goes to your point specifically, is that it takes anywhere from 60 to 90 minutes for a patient to be onboarded to a to a practice. And so that's 90 minutes out of the physician's day that they, they might otherwise be seeing, let's just say, five patients. And so if we can find a way to have somebody else do that and, and do the workup, then everybody's time is more um, efficiently used. So in effect, that's what we did do. And so that's happened. And, and that clinic has taken on, has onboarded those patients. And we now have a way to scale that to other clinics across the province. And just by doing that simple people working to scope and doing their you know doing the part of the job that that they should be doing we can take i think the numbers about 17,000 people off of the list and that's without really pushing it hard so it's very encouraging and you're absolutely right the, f the final point i would make i'm looking at these numbers every day and i just find it really interesting um on virtual care the average visit time is between 20 and 25 minutes. And so, uh, you know, that's physicians and nurse practitioners. But it's, uh, I just found it interesting in light of your comments or, you know, because I've been in the same 10 minute segment too. Um, and so I find it really interesting that it's taking a little bit more time on the virtual care and maybe it's because they have to take time to go through some of the history. Anyway. So, good point, thank you. Thank you, so we have a question here. And so we have one and then two. And so, yeah, we'll start with those two and we'll, yeah, go ahead. Okay, um, I don't so much have a question as I have an observation. Uh, and I think it's relevant and hopefully useful. Um, I, I totally agree that the system needs to be rethought and reworked and I'm encouraged to hear that some of that is happening. But I don't think we can solve the health care problem without tackling the funding issue. Uh, because from my point of view, um, the, the system was never properly set up with a funding model. And until the funding model is addressed, the rest of the problems will continue in one form or another. I think all of the, the major problems we have in the system really flow from the funding model. And let me explain that. First of all, um, everywhere in the world, not just here, uh, affordability is the chief problem in healthcare. Everywhere, not just in Nova Scotia. Uh, a few countries, including Canada, decided that they could afford publicly funded healthcare. And there's not a lot of them in the world. Most countries don't have them. Uh, we're one of the ones that do. And now we're seeing that we can't afford it either. <laughs> because uh, we didn't fund it properly. The idea that healthcare can be funded through an annual government budgeting process does not work. We have a steady flow of patients, but we have a fixed amount of money to serve them, and that does not work. If you think about how a business works, um, 
if there's a flow of customers, there's also a flow of revenue to pay the costs of serving the customers. We do not have that in healthcare. Um, so when you, look, when you think about public funding of healthcare, in effect, it's a pooling of risk, just the same as an insurance uh, type of operation, except that in an insurance operation, we do have a steady flow of money into the system to fund the costs that flow out of it. So we didn't set it up as a proper pooling of risk, but in effect, the taxpayers undertook to pay for the, the health care risks in the population. And in recent years, we've seen that the number of patients drawing out of the system has increased, and costs have increased faster than the amount of money available to pay for it. Uh, I think what we need, ultimately, is a self-funding system. We have to take it away from a government budgeting process. We have to set it up as a self-funding system, much the same as we do with workers' compensation, with Canada Pension Plan, with employment insurance, other risks that we see in society. And until we set it up with a proper funding model, I don't think the dysfunction will go away. That's my observation. Thank you for that. And um, there were two questions that were uh, submitted that pertain to the um, uh, health minister's conference in Vancouver earlier this month. And our deputy was in attendance there. And so I'm, I'm going to ask her, put you on the spot, Janine, and ask you to share what you could share on, you know, um, I'll, I'll take your comment. I've made a note of it, um, you know, but I think it's, it opens a larger issue in terms of funding. So I just invite you to share what you can, Janine, and, and just, you know, put, put that out there as well. Sure. I think that the question as submitted was kind of what was the proposal that was submitted at the minister's meeting that was not accepted. And I think it's a bit, uh, there was two things. The first one is that um, the Council of the Federation, all of the premiers have for a number, for a while now, have been taken a, a consistent position that their, their position is that the federal government should be paying 35% of, of healthcare costs. So that's kind of the, the provincial position has been that. Um, the federal government, we, they, there's different numbers, right, that the provinces say that they're paying a certain amount right now. The federal government are taking the position that they are paying more. At the end of the day, the premiers are asking for 35%. So the discussion at the health minister's meeting was, was not in particular about the funding. It was about um, health workforce and digital systems and a number of different things, but the two obviously came together because you in many cases can't talk about one without the other right so i think that that's that's really where we're at is that health ministers are working hard all of them all of the provincial health ministers are working extremely hard in their jurisdictions to advance their systems and in parallel to that we have this funding issue that's outstanding there has also been some movement um, on behalf of the federal government to say that they do have potentially other funds that they would like to work bilaterally with individual provinces on, but we still have, it's more to come on that, that we don't have any further details on that. No, but I think it's fair to say that um, life goes on and, and you know, in many ways, people don't distinguish between different levels. Like people need care and we need care today. We need this, we need this, we need this. So, so this is our, this is our challenge. And, uh, you know, we do, we work extremely closely together, but, um, you know what would I say? It's uh, it's not, that part's not really that fun, you know. So we 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 do our part and try to keep our head down and do the work. But uh, you know, there's a lot of th things floating around as well. So you know, Janine and I were in Ottawa last week um, to you know see see where we can uh, perhaps inv have partners for some of our pilot projects, which are important. So. That's where we are. Okay, thank you. We have gentlemen here, and then so we're starting all kinds of hands coming up. So we're gonna do one, two, three, four, five, six, and then we'll pause. <laughs> okay, so I think we got one. I feel like I'm at an auction. I was one and two, and yeah. So here next, and then you're, and then second, third. 
Uh, great, thank you very much, and thanks for the opportunity to be here and the time that you're spending on it. Um, I'd like to speak, I guess, as someone maybe different from the previous speaker, in that I was involved in the development of the Canada Health Act 40 years ago, and what that process meant and how how much it took to get that those, those publicly funded principles in place. Uh, that's not the full answer to the question of funding, but it is a step forward. But I'm also a member of a community health center, the North End Community Health Center in Halifax, which has been around for about 40 years, and I think is certainly worth looking at as as part of the proposals that you're you're considering and how a community-based system could help address the funding issues that we're seeing. And in our case, we offer mobile services. We offer primary care, as you may know, uh, Karen. And uh, so I think it's worth looking at. And there, there is, a, I think, a provincial association that could work with that as well. So I'd certainly urge you to, if you're not already, to look at it. But if I could ask just a related question, and a concern maybe to the previous question is, uh, from person who spoke is, to what extent are you looking at privatization as an approach? Uh, I'm concerned about what that means and where you may be going. I'm concerned about some of the things your government has already brought forward in terms of privatization with the IWK and surgery alternatives. And I, I don't think that's the direction we should be going in. We should be looking at building the public system and not taking away from what, what we have. I, I know we have to look at alternatives, but I don't think that's one of them we should be considering. Thank you. So the, the IWK project in particular at, at Scotia Surgery, that is, a, you are correct, that is a private facility, but all, everything there is publicly funded. That, that, that the contract that we have there is, is fully publicly funded. The services are just being delivered in, in a different facility. So that's, that's really, we don't have any, we're, we have different uh, partnerships like that, but it's all fully funded publicly. Yeah, and as far as, you know, we're, we're not operating on any other premise at this moment in time, you know, and I think, uh, I think the Premier's on record for that as well. So, you know, we're not going down a privatization road at this time. I mean, who knows where we're going to end up in five years, ten years, but right now, Janine and I, straight ahead. Thank you. Okay. Here and then there and then there. Hi, thanks. Um, my name's Jane. I'm from Dartmouth. I've been involved in all kinds of things here, including being on the school board when there was one. That's a discussion for a different day. Um, it was Virginia Satir who said that the problem is never the problem. It's a symptom of something that's much deeper. So one of our problems is Nova Scotians smoke the most. They drink the most. They are the most overweight. Um, they are on the wrong end of every scale, nationally. I have a thing about cigarette butts. My friends know that. When I go for walks, I take things with me. I'm going to buy myself one of those battery-operated vacuums. Right? <laughs> you don't want to walk anywhere in a public place. There are no smoking in indoor spaces, so you just have to count the cigarette butts, never mind the fish they're killing to know there's a problem. I picked up 1,380 cigarette butts in the parking lot at Micmac Canoe Club. It's right beside Lake Pinook. <laughs> Three cigarette butts in a liter of water will kill minnows in 20 minutes. So there's all kinds of problems around that. I think fewer kids would start smoking if we didn't have filters on cigarettes. I don't know the truth. So what are we doing to get Nova Scotia somewhere down the scale on all those lists? What are we doing, and what are we doing, right? What? The education system doesn't nearly come close enough to addressing this. Insurance companies are a problem. <laughs> the insurance company for the education system promotes so many barriers, as it does in other places as well. In my school, in my neighborhood, is right next door to the Maybank playing field. You can go there and play soccer. There's a chain link fence and a gate. Like you walk, kids walk through there to get to school. The teachers cannot take the children from their classroom to that playing field off the school grounds, God forbid, to play soccer or run around the field 
get their daily exercise and fresh air without getting a signed permission slip from each parent. We're talking about fitness here. We're talking about instruction. We're talking about how we're going to get the message out. The problem is not what you're seeing. It's something that's deeper, right? Let's find out what's causing this stuff. Here, here. So I, I just wanted to add, said so, add something, Nancy. Um, in Action for Health, Solution 6 is about health promotion and community wellness. So it is one of our six pillars in our strategic plan. And we will be doing a number of initiatives over the next couple of years in regard to community wellness. It feeds into the gentleman's question earlier before about uh, or community-based organizations and community health clinics and the role that they can play in community wellness. And so I can tell you that it is, it's a very big focus and that we have an entire solution devoted to health promotion. So there is work that already goes on now in our you know, public health branches, both through the department and Nova Scotia Health, but we do know that there needs to be a bigger focus on community wellness. So there is, within Action for Health, there is a whole stream of work that's gonna be going on in that area. Definitely, and, and the other point I would just add is that, uh, you know, healthcare is the number one priority of our provincial government at this time, and so it's it's an all hands on deck. So it's not just the health authority, the Department of Health. It's actually all departments. And Janine and I have had the opportunity to present uh, several times to. Uh, you know, on Monday mornings, all deputies in the province meet and uh, we're asked to come regularly to uh, present to the deputies and to find ways where those deputies can uh, work to support us as well. So I'll just give you a small example. Uh, at a recent uh, presentation that we made, um, it was um, the, the, the uh, deputy of community services uh, shared a partnership that they've recently entered into with Canada Post and the purpose of the partnership is to have uh, some of the um, clientele at Department of uh, Community Services work in roles at Canada Post and so it's win-win and and so you know ding 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 we have so many jobs surely to heavens there are opportunities for to do a partnership within not just going to canada post but within and so um you know if we can set something up that helps that helps to par the the uh, clients of community services it helps me it, it's win 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 and certainly good for people who are able to to then contribute Etc. So, you know, it's 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 not one thing. This is a very interconnected uh, system, and and you know what I would like to share is that we really are looking at it from that perspective, but it is one big mountain to move. Yeah. Okay, you got a quick one, Jane, because there's like no. Yeah, there's a lot of other questions. Sorry, I know. My own other experiences to do with community colleges, and I lived in Ontario for a while, back and forth, and. I have a background in adult education and consulting and whatnot. So I was the coordinator for programs for students at the a community college, for summer programs for students at a community college in Toronto. We do not have such a thing here. In PEI, students in high school can take three credits at the community college towards their high school graduation. So they can try out other stuff. If I was a kid between 12 and 16 or 17 and went to camp for three or four summers and took some course at the community college that had to do with health and home care and something else, I could start getting a job as a student when I'm doing something else. We have to change the model and we have to use the resources we've got, not lock up our community colleges in the summer. I'm sorry, they're very underused. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank Jane. you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So yeah, right back here and then and then here and then there. And then there. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. We'll get you. But I you know it's you and then you. Yeah. One, two. 
Thank we'll you. work it out. We'll get you. <laughs> we'll get you. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, was, uh, at the beginning of our talk uh, this evening, uh, somebody mentioned it's all about solutions. So I want to ask about a very specific uh, Dartmouth-centered solution, if you don't mind. Um, uh, and I'll just say it. I'm somebody who uh, lived here for five or six years. I moved here from Annie Ganesh. Um, my doctor didn't move with me. Um, uh, you know, we have a close relationship, but it didn't work out. So. <laughs> I am still commuting to Annie Ganesh to see my doctor. Uh, my two kids who are here uh, don't have doctors either. Um, so um, a number of people have said, and in fact, I, I knew just a, a week or so ago on, uh, on CBC that I was listening to Andre Picard of the Globe and Mail saying, hey, we know that what the solutions are to these problems. We, we just haven't figured out how to apply them or implement them. And a number of you have said already that one of the obvious solutions to the issues that we're facing uh, is uh, a model of moving towards a model of collaborative care uh, in healthcare. So I want to ask a very simple, specific question. Uh, what will it take to get Dartmouth, a collaborative care clinic, open up where we, the citizens of Dartmouth, get ready access to doctors, but also all the other related services? And um, I, I, I don't mean to draw the line with, with community health base, but it's a slightly different thing. I mean, I, my view is, Collaborative care is just a different way of organizing the government health care programs and, uh, you know, involving communities is great, but it's not necessary in my view. So that's my question. When, 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 uh, where do you want to put it and when can we open it up? <laughs> oh, don't put me on the spot like that. Come on. Um, I, I, will sh I will totally say that uh, there are many discussions about clinics. Um, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't really want to be put on the spot in terms of saying this date, this this place, this will happen. I will tell you, it very much is under discussion. And when I mentioned when I mentioned earlier about the Dalhousie Family Clinic and what we were able to do there, um, certainly Dartmouth North has come up in the context of that kind of con of that conversation as well. Like we we are actively looking. Let me just say that. We are actively looking. So I can't tell you this date, this place, we are looking at it. Okay, thank you. Hi there. <laughs> I am proud. Um, I'm Kathy Caswell. I live in Waverly and I really appreciate this conversation to be able to hear ideas and share ideas. So we are going through really intense times right now. We're all feeling the stress and we're all reacting and we're not necessarily always as kind and patient as we would like to be. And it is affecting our physical and our mental health. And there is an integrative therapeutic and coaching model that is available called Logosynthesis and it is being used to treat mental health issues and support stress and burnout prevention internationally. And it shifts energy so that people feel better. And people trained in the model prefer it because of the results it delivers. They prefer it because of the speed of the work, the ease of use, the comfort in using it, and that it targets what people are there for. And so, um, there are a number of people that have been training here in Nova Scotia. A number of people may have heard of it or experienced it. There's a lady in Anaganish that read, wrote a book somewhere north of where we are, and she talks about using this. And when I sent a note to her to say, oh, I'm interested in learning more, she said, it saved my life. So it's, um, the challenge is it, the first study is a pilot study is being presented to the Swiss Congress of Psychiatry and Psychotherapy, so it is not yet evidence-based. And then my question is, how do we start to recognize the benefits in our healthcare system? Do we have to wait till it's evidence-based? How do we pilot things? And then it's this community, right, that can make some difference. So. Yeah, how do we do? Thank you, Kathy. And, um, you know, therapeutics and different and alternative uh, methods of treatment and so forth have come up at various other uh, sessions that we've had around the province. And so I guess 
Short answer would be, you know, we, we really have taken on a test and try mentality, or we've, we're trying to. So we're trying to make sure that things aren't perfect before they get kicked out the door. Um, I can speak to you after. I can get some more information, and I can try to give you a, a, a path in terms of who would be the right person to talk to. So, yeah, just, just make sure I get your info after, please. Yeah. Well, we're, we're about solutions, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know, I'm sorry I missed you, didn't I? My, and I'm, I'm going to say thank you for your patience for those of you that I'm trying to keep track of what order we're in, but I think we're next here. Yes, I think. Okay, so I, think um, I do think I jumped into line. Did you jump the line? But, but <gasps> I, I'll try to be quick, and it's very much on the same theme as we've been um, hearing from a couple of other folks around the collaborative care approach and the community-based team models that Nova Scotia can be very proud of. Now, I'm going to admit that I am old, and I studied nursing in the 70s, and what we're talking about today was what we were doing then. And the successful model in the North End is to be applauded and copied. There are parts of rural Nova Scotia that are very effectively using a collaborative care model that I am dying to get access to in Dartmouth as our friend from Anaganish is. And I know it feels like we're putting you on the spot, but sorry, it's been since 1980 that we've been talking about it and looking at it. We don't need to look anymore. We've been, you know, CBC a few years ago was, was a, you know, applauding the, the collaborative care model out of Nova Scotia, yet we keep looking at it. So what, could, what can my family practice do to get a hold of it? Uh, th so I think we should put some of the myths to, to bed right now, okay? We're not looking at it. We're doing it. We're doing it. Now, it doesn't mean it goes in every community in exactly the same way. It's not cookie cutter. We have 96 in Nova Scotia right now today. There are 96 such clinics. So. Um, Maria, I don't want to put you on the spot, but uh, this is kind of your gig, so you should maybe elaborate. So, so I think it's really a question of putting them together. It's not a question of do we do it or don't do it. Like, we're way past that. And I've only been there for 15 months. So, you know. So we have some right now. Like, for instance, Woodlawn is a collaborative care clinic. So we do have one at Dartmouth. We have one in Albro Lake. Um, we, we are planning, we're looking for more locations, both in Halifax and in Dartmouth. So these are, these are going to happen. Like, what happened was a lot of the rural areas maybe got them first because they had a lot of pressures with no doctors. Now Halifax is having the same problem. So we're looking for more locations. So the stuff that you heard about the Dow Family Medicine project, we're going to use that model and we're going to spread it across Nova Scotia. So stay tuned because it's going to happen. And we're not talking about five years. Yeah. We're talking about, what is it, one year, two years? <laughs> I'm, putting, I'm saying the same thing that we're being told. It's going to be faster than later, OK? So that's my pledge to you. Pass right there. Yeah, thank you. How's it going? Um, so my question is about the plan itself um, over the four year, like the four year plan. Um, when I read through it, it seemed like a lot of the statements and the goals didn't seem to be really detail orientated. They seemed to be a little bit open to interpretation. Like, uh, as an example, try and retain as many people as possible. But is there a way now that you're, like, I understand it's probably tough going into it because you're going into the unknown a little bit in terms of what you needed to do. But now that we're a year in, are we going to actually see what the targets are for the next three years? And, like, as an example, you said, for every doctor that's leaving, we need to replace it with three. So do we know specifically how many doctors we need to get in to facilitate the healthcare system here? And is that going to be made transparent to us so we know what's going on? And just to piggyback off that a little bit, the, the same with the, the doctor registry, like so people know how many people are in that queue because the report came out that there's over 100,000 people and then the Premier came out and said, no, I don't think it's that much. And it's like, come on, like, it's one or the other. You, you got to keep us informed so we know what's going on. Um, yeah, and that's my question, just is there going to be more, a little bit more transparency and accuracy in what the targets are for the, the remaining three years? And yeah, I'd like to hear that. Yeah, Kim, can I put you on the spot to come up for a sec to talk about this? 
There's so we could talk about the registry yeah. where we want to go with that. That's what I was going to say. But just about the, the action for health targets. Yep. I'm going to get. This is um, Kim Barrow. She's a resident here of Dartmouth, and she's one of our senior executive directors in the Department of Health, who does a lot of work related to the accountability provisions of Action for Health. So she can maybe give you a bit of information about what's currently available on targets and where we'll go from there. Yeah, so we, we do have a multi-year accountability plan, and we're absolutely committed to transparency. I think it's taken us a bit of time to sort of understand as you've I think I'm looking at the person who asked the yeah, question. <laughs> yes, yeah. um, you know, to actually understand what our target should be, and to make sure that you know, sort of the reasonable, and that we can do that. So, um, what I could say is we have a good start. If you go on the website, we're doing there. There is absence of targets, and we're working very hard to do that. The next pieces that you'll actually see, and some of this has got to do with the health promotion piece, is what are our population targets? How will we know if we're getting healthier or not as a population? So we're committed, we start it, we're gonna grow it and continue to do that, and our, our aim is to be as transparent as we possibly can. And when you, when you go on the Auction for Health site, there are drop downs yeah. on each of the solutions that you can go down to see what is planned, what yeah. has been achieved, what is going. Yeah. And I think the next release is actually tomorrow, tomorrow. Kim, if I'm correct, yeah. right? But so yeah. we'll all be updated yeah. tomorrow and you should be have. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think if citizens have interest in what would be meaningful to them, like you've said, you know, what's the target for physicians? That's an easy one. But if people have things that are meaningful and they want to kind of know what that might be. I think that. We, at the, we'd be happy to hear that because, again, it's, it's for you to understand our performance and, um, and to help, you know, um, help us on our journey of getting to where we need to go to world class. So. Thank you, Kim. Um, in relation to the need of family practice registry, there's work underway on that as we speak because right now the list is very static. Right? It's not getting, we, we don't, and we don't have enough information about people who are on it. How people are um, taken off of the list is not always consistent. So we're doing a lot of work to be able to use it, uh, to have it as a more interactive and, and a better tool for both uh, providers and for patients so that you have a better sense of where you are, what you're listening, you can give more information on it. So again, that's I, we're saying stay tuned a lot, but I can tell you that there's active work underway on the need of family practice registry to make it better for citizens for sure. I, I think the first two quarters um, of 23, a lot of the things that we're talking about are pretty much ready to go. So, um, you know, we've spent the last 15 months like, digging to the bottom of the well and once we got to the bottom of the well, then building the ladder to get out. So I, 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 I'm comfortable that we're, yeah. we're, we have the momentum. So, so um, yes, the update will come out tomorrow. The list, we really need to f have it more, um, we need to be able to use it in better fashions. We need the data, people need the data, which kind of takes me to the next, um, it, it wasn't part of your question, but I think it's relevant. Uh, one of the things that we're, working really hard on um, is there are many jurisdictions who are able, where the citizens are able to have their health care in the palm of their hand. So through apps and other, you know, you, you can name many different, even like TELUS Health, but lo lots of different uh, tools that can be used where people have access to either appointments, to their blood work, to results, to numerous things. And, and we want that too. You heard Dr. Bussey talk about technology uh, hampering progress. And um, in many ways, I think we're actually going to be able to leapfrog some of the where we are to where we would like to go. So we have strict instructions to get going on this stuff, and, and we are trying to. Okay, thank you. I think we had a question at the back. Was there somebody at the back that, yeah, but I th yeah I'm sorry, I do see you too, but I thought there was someone else. Is there not somebody in the back back? And it's okay if you changed your mind or if your question's already been answered, but was there somebody a little while ago that had their back, hand up in the back, or did I just miss it? Okay. No, okay. So I think... This, sorry, she, she was before you? See, we're such polite Nova Scotians. We self-disclose when we jump the line, and we say who's in front of us. I'm from Alberta, 
Oh, <laughs> than Canadians in general. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, well, I was born in BC, so um, <laughs> a little bit farther, but I've been living here for a million years. Um, so uh, a, a couple of things. Uh, the health promotion, I, I really like what you were saying about that because I've been doing a lot of research. Um, I'm a professor of nursing at Dell, so just to let you know who I am. But um, the health promotion is so important, but what we have to do is change our health promotion in the school system. There isn't the cooking anymore. There isn't the half the time there isn't gym or anything. You know, we've got so much to do. That's right. And, and, and the hunger problem in Nova Scotia is huge. And we're serving, some schools are still ser are serving breakfast or lunch programs, but the food isn't necessarily healthy, you know, and we need to be changing that a lot. If the kids are going to change their behavior, they have to learn how to do it. That's number one. Number two, um, I'm constantly um, flooded by um, we need more nurses, we know, need more physicians, and obviously I know nursing better, but we've got so many nurses in other countries, like in the UK or Australia or whatever, coming from those countries, not from necessarily you know other Middle Eastern countries, but from the UK and the Australia, whatever, it takes them three years to get registered in Canada. Think about that. This is ridiculous. Why is that going on? We need so much change, so much change to bring people in. Because I've talked to people who've said, oh, I'd really like to come to Canada. I, and as you were mentioning earlier, I've got a group of people who want to come. That's what's going to make it stay. They're not going to stay if they're just an end of right. one. And so we have to do so much more about that. So, I mean, those are my big issues about recruiting. Um, let's be, let's take a different um, approach to that. And holistically, right from the very beginning, you know, Nova Scotia is not, I agree exactly with what you were saying earlier about um, how unhealthy we are and, and what's going on in Nova Scotia. I work a lot with homeless people as well. We have, and when we're looking at mental health issues, um, drug overdoses, all that kind of stuff that we're not addressing in a holistic way. And you know, we shouldn't just say, oh, it's you. No, it's not just you. What are we gonna do? How did you get to be this way? There, for so many, there's a lot of trauma, trauma and violence that has been going on. And we need to be addressing that again in a holistic way. Health promotion, not just you know, siloing what we're doing, yes, and siloing the treatment. Here, here, yep. you know, you, you, you're getting a violent agreement from Janine and myself, and, and you know, you, you make a really great point because in a way there's so much to do. So a person could go to work and be overwhelmed. You could. But that's not going to fix it. So you just, it's, it's the quintessential challenge of eating the elephant, right? One bite at a time, and that's what we're doing. So, you know, I, I totally appreciate that folk, that people have different uh, concerns and worries, and, and it, it's a rare one that we haven't heard, but, but we can't do every single thing at once. So we're, we're trying to hit the higher impact, but we are well aware that it's so much. And that's why we look for solutions because, uh, you know, I, I've said this before um, at other forums, which is it's not, um, you know, we don't have a lack of political will that's holding us back. And, and, and the, on the dollar side, uh, this year alone, the health budget was uh, increased. So, you know, the limit is only our imagination. And when I say our, I don't mean, you know, me, Janine, and a few, and folks from health, but it's, it's really conversations like this that are so important because we, we may not know it, we may not see it, but if we don't listen, we'll never know. So I appreciate yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Japanese school lunch yeah. programs. We'll look it up. So Dr. Google it.
the, the other thing that I would just add to that to Karen's point is Karen spoke earlier about you know our our other department colleagues and I think you're I'm actually it's great because I've got three or four things written down here already to take back to my colleagues on Monday morning about because and, I, and when we we talk about action for health amongst the departmental group because it's about housing it's yeah. about community service it's about economic development like everybody and so like action for health is not just a health system wide plan it's a it's really all of a, a whole of department plan whole of government plan i should say so i like i said i've written down a couple of your comments to take back because if we aren't help or if our colleagues aren't helping us to solve issues like housing then there are some things that we aren't going to be able to solve through the health system so it is really to, to assure you, the plan is seen, and that's how our department colleagues speak about it. That's how they put initiatives forward. It's all about helping us to achieve our goals through Action for Health. Thank you. I see some hands. Everybody's getting really excited. So we've got somebody, sorry, we've got one, two, and then three in the front, and then, then, we'll, go again. then, we'll, then we'll count again. So we do, I do see, and yeah, so you. Very quickly. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Actually, no, sorry. It's the gentleman in the back with the, he's, sorry. But Hello? There we go. Oh, yeah, sorry. And we'll get to you. I knew I shouldn't let BC speak first. That was Alberta. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> hey, go ahead, Alberta. We hear you. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, you know, for, for getting out and, and running these uh, opportunities to, to uh, participate in discussion. And I agree with what's been said around trauma. We're all in a state of trauma, post-COVID trauma global overload of information around all the all the disasters in in the world and everything but we're also vulnerable to globalization in terms of uh, accessing certain products and things like that which affects our personal economies and and what can be provided in terms of the healthcare system so initially i started thinking about nutrition and part of public health and and that we, you know, it's, we need to reduce our vulnerability to the global food chain and maybe start to look at some forms of subsidies for healthy foods as opposed to potato chips and pop and all of these manu like uh, uh, cheap products that people can buy because they're, that's what they can afford. If we subsidize that, we reduce our... Uh, diabetes levels, our obesity levels, all of the complications that are involved in that. And so can this government look at anything to that effect? I'll tell you, I spent four and a half months in DG and BG with pancreatitis. I almost died. And one of the things that almost killed me was the food in the hospital. <laughs> could, could I ask when, when you were in the hospital? That was in March 30th, 2021 to uh, July 25th, 2021, and then I followed up with three months of, of heavy-duty vancomycin and, and all kinds of stuff. So, the, you know, it was, and I'm not being facetious, had my wife who had difficulty yeah. trying to bring food into me in a, during COVID yeah. not brought that bit of food, I refused to eat that stuff. It was traumatic. I, I take your point, and... Um, I can assure you, if you had the unfortunate circumstance of going back into the hospital, I, I, I think it would be a little bit better right now. And uh, it just reminds me, uh, I don't know, this time last year I received, actually the minister received some, a series of photographs of food that was served, which then came to me, which I've never seen again since, because I think we've made some improvements. Uh, I, I w always worry about assuring that it's fixed, but I think we've made some improvements. We certainly have tried to, and the the folks who are on the uh, you know are are, are uh, folks in charge of food services have heard this for many many years, and there's opportunity. Like how I see this is really simple. Like we bought. Um, 
I want to say 100,000 pounds of chicken that was uh, produced in Nova Scotia last year. And when we think of Nova Scotia, blueberry capital of the world, and some of the other products that we have, like we can help ourselves by helping ourselves, right? So yes, uh, we have a mandate to actually do 20% of our food uh, from you know locally produced uh, suppliers and it's something I take seriously even if it wasn't in the mandate because we can help us help ourselves that's jobs that's local you know production and and all good things come from that so it's a very good point and I don't know if you have anything that you wanted to add to that so ag agreed thank you I always enjoy the the what's the expression you use you violently agree yep <laughs> yeah. um, so I think someone's here and here, and then we'll get you. So here, then here, then here, and then. Oh gosh. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thanks. Hello. Oh. Yep. <laughs> You're there. Um, I just want to take us back a few minutes. You were talking about digging down deep into the well to see what's there. Did you find O P O R? <laughs> <laughs> By any chance? I'm. I'm who, currently tell me, tell me who you are. <laughs> tell, tell me who you are, and does it matter to you? It does very much matter to me. Okay. I'm going to NSCC for Health Information Management. Yep. We're the people who put all of the information into the system so that you all have data to use to fix things. We're the people who are going to be building it. So you are the people who are going to be building it and working in it for many years to come. So. Talk, talk to the people, Christy. I couldn't run up here fast enough. So <laughs> before, before I came into my current role with Nova Scotia Health, my position was as the interim chief medical information officer with Nova Scotia Health and the IWK working on OPOR. Um, and so this ties together a lot of the comments. There was a gentleman here um, asking about the 10 minute, right, in your family practice office 10 minutes. A lot of what we waste our time at as clinicians is asking the same questions over and over and over again because we don't have a unified record to record the answers to the questions. You know it. Anyone, I work in the hospital, I'm asking the same questions that the paramedic asks, that the nurse asks in triage, that the med student, that the resident, that everyone is asking. And we do not have at present a good and efficient way of communicating with primary care providers in these collaborative health clinics, right? We don't. So we know our community um, family practices, many of them, and collaborative care clinics, many of them do have electronic medical records. Um, we have not kept up with the pace that we need to in Nova Scotia to try and evolve to this point, right? We see it with bank records. We went from going into a teller, then you get a bank card, now you can do it online, right? Using, using your hand, using your, your app on your phone. Um, so OPOR is very, very important to me personally, it's very important to us. Um, and it was in the Action for Health, which has been referenced so many times. And as an OPOR team, I can tell you we were really excited uh, when we saw that. Um, and there's so much opportunity there. It kind of, for me, unifies a lot of recruitment, of retention, the improvement for patients to hold your own health care record and be your own advocate and the opportunity to be an advocate. Sometimes there is a misconception, I think, from patients that the communication happens back and forth. It does to a degree. It's not completely missing, but it needs to be unified. You just did. Yeah. It needs to be unified in a place where every family physician in the province can have access to that information, everyone in primary care, and patients can have access to their own information too. Right? That's really, really important. Yeah, Thank so you. I think, um, to, you know, to answer your question, it, it's so high up on the list that it, there's, not a ho it's, there's not a whole lot higher. And uh, a lot of due diligence has gone into a lengthy process and um, we're hoping for decisions very soon, yeah. Okay, thank you. We actually have some, uh, somebody. It's, I, I think it's almost in the front, it's almost harder to get there, so I'll let you go. And then, and then you're next. Hi, um, I arrived a little late, so if you already spoke to this, please just tell me so, so we don't waste more time. Um, I'm Liz, and I'm a doula, um, and I wanted to speak to a little bit um, about the uh, scope and using the resources that we already have here in Nova Scotia. 
So um, it strikes me that in Nova Scotia, there's a lot of people who are ready to go, a lot of people who are ready to work in the healthcare system, um, but cannot due to bureaucratic hoops that they have to jump through, um, be it bridging programs or, or things like that. Um, I also think there's people like me who I would love to be a midwife, but there's no midwifery program here, and it's not possible for me where I'm in my life right now to move um, to do a midwifery program and then move my family back and potentially not be able to get a job here anyway. Um, so I decided to be a doula for that reason. Um, I'm seeing in the media just a couple of weeks ago um, at IWK there was someone who spoke out about not having the care she needed while she was in labor, um, left alone for long hours of, of in her early labor, um, which clinically is safe, but um, in terms of trauma and the patient experience is, is traumatizing. Um, and I think in the long run leads to um, more health care costs because if she goes on to have another baby, she's going to need a lot more care, potentially from an OBGYN instead of a regular doctor because she has existing trauma already. Um, my point being, I'll get to the point, um, I, I would love to be able to be someone who's supporting someone in um, ELU, the Early Labor and Assessment Unit, um, but I, the Nova Scotia, uh, health do not hire doulas. We have to be private. Um, I'm wondering, you know, the whole reason that these people are not getting the care they need is because there's a nursing shortage, but there are people like me who could be filling those gaps, um, who would be paid a whole lot less than a nurse would, so win-win. Um, <laughs> and we could be working in the IWK or, or a nearby building to support those people who are in early labor. Um, I also think this, this doesn't just apply to my line of work, so it's things like dietitians. There are many dietitians out there struggling to find work who could be doing that education piece in schools, um, in the hospital. There are people I know who are trying to start up businesses for healthy vending machines. Hospitals need healthy vending machines. There's a lot of people sitting, waiting, struggling to make an income who could be making a really great income if they were hired by Nova Scotia Health. And I totally agree with that. I, I'm, I've got my own bone to pick on that stuff. Like we, we have, um, for example, we graduate many students in our province uh, from science programs or from kinesiology programs. In my mind, there, you know, with some adaptation, some bridging, some help, all of those highly educated science-related uh, grads should be landing somewhere in our health system. So I, I agree with you. So then the question is, how do we do it? And that's kind of where my, that's where my head is. Uh, like, for example, I, I think of the kinesiology students. Um, we don't hire that many kinesiologists, per se, at Nova Scotia Health. And many of them will go to school. They may or may not get into med school, but they have their degree. What can we do with them? And you could, I'm just picking on kinesiologists, but it's the same, dietitians, it's the same thing. So with that kind of education, surely to heavens, we can find a spot for them. So I kind of look at it and I say, yes, we can find a spot. We just have to do the work. We just have to do a little bit more work to, to land them. So we're trying. So thank you. And on the doula point, I don't know. Neither does Janine. So we would ha I, would actually have to, I would actually have to do some work on that and get back to you. So, and I'm happy to speak to you later and, and get your email. So thank you. Yes, we yeah. do have midwives, they're yeah. and they're amazing, and I don't know about the program either, Janine. Okay, thank you, and, I, and I'm, I'm conscious of time, so I'm just, I know we only, so I'm just, I'm, I'm not, again, I'm doing my pointing. So we've got two people that have the mics right now, so I'm just going to give my advanced, I'm sorry, to the people that maybe still have questions, and make sure you write them on your card with your contact information, and I do have somebody's card here that I didn't get to read, and I don't have the contact information for it, so if you filled out a card for me to read, please see me, and we'll get your contact information. Sorry, go ahead. I'm cognizant of the time, so this is a very quick question. Olga Milosevic, resident of Halifax. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Just want to ask, um, it was mentioned Japan has this fascinating um, school program, lunch school program that's very successful. Want to ask quickly, have you been looking at other countries yes. and who is doing getting the gold star in terms of providing adequate care for their citizens in the community both in the acute care system, regular medical system, long-term care system. Just quickly, Dr. Samir Sinha was interviewed on um, a CBC program. 
marketplace a couple of months ago, and the reporter asked, it was about long-term care, it was the crisis in long-term care here in Canada, in Nova Scotia, but right across the country, and he was asked, who gets the gold star? And he said, the reporter asked him, and he said, Denmark. And then they went to Denmark, and they toured nursing homes around Denmark, and showed us, you know, why they've got the gold star and what they're doing right. What my question is, are you looking at successful models around the world, and what can be replicated here? So we met him when we were in Denmark. <laughs> we, we could have been on that show too, okay? So, and, and yes, Denmark does get a gold star, but I'm gonna share some stories with you. So we were there, and the reason we were there is because uh, the minister was invited to go and to present. And there were three, pro um, uh, f uh, four provinces that were invited, Nova Scotia, Quebec, Alberta, and Northwest Territories. Why those four? We think because they were all trying to be a bit transformative, I, I, we think. But in any event, the minister was kind enough to um, arrange for the deputy and myself to go along. And, and what we did do was took um, two extra days to go and see with our own eyes, uh, like a, me a medical clinic, the long-term care, the EHS, you know, to, to see if we could learn anything, uh, et cetera. And, and you know, they, they do have a very uh, highly developed system for their uh, citizens. And one of the things, and, you know, again, to talk about data and technology, but they've been, they have, um, everything's on their health card, everything, and they have 50 years of data. And, and what they are able to do with that is just astronomical. So we're very interested in that. Uh, their EHS system, sophisticated. Uh, we, you know, the, the person who runs that, we'd like to bring him to Nova Scotia just to learn and share. Other ideas, though, uh, which we took from, which I really like, the minister loves, is they have a program, chemo to go So... Not for all cancers, but for some, where a person can uh, receive their, a canister for care and go about their day and not be, they could be in their home, in their community, at work, what have you. So we had the folks come, we're already engaged. Like, we want that, I want that, because I think that's very good for people, particularly outside of the city, but it's anybody who would be eligible. Uh, and they want to learn from us. Now, this is very important, and I think it's, I don't know what time it is, but I, I think it's a good, <laughs> 10 to 9, okay, so there may be one more question, but they want to learn from us too. And what we do really well here in, uh, in Nova Scotia, among other things, but one is robotics. So our robotics here at the Dartmouth General with the Mako in Halifax, we are either number one or number two in this country with robotic surgery, okay? People want to learn from us. So what I'm trying to say is that, yes, we have problems. There's no question about it. That's why we're here. We want to learn. We're fixing bottom of the well, climbing out of the well, and so forth. But, but we have ingenious, creative, smart people. We're pretty good, too. Okay, we're pretty good too. And so I think, you know, being limited only by our imagination, when we put our minds to it and put the right people in the room, and we're very good at that. We're very good at collaborating. Uh, so, you know, we also have some things to be proud of. I, I do want our citizens to, to take that away as well, because it is not all for naught. There are many good things as well. Thank you. So we have, I think, time for one more question. I feel like there's all this pressure on you for this. I know, question. I don't want to have the <laughs> last word. <laughs> um, I'm, a, I'm a local MLA, Sue LeBlanc, and uh, I have the privilege of uh, hearing <laughs> uh, from Janine and Karen a lot on public accounts and on the health committee and the legislature, so thank you so much for being here. Um, but two things I just wanted to add to the conversation. Um, thank you for bringing up doulas and midwives. I think that the midwife uh, piece is really, really important for our primary care and our, and our um, OBGYN care. We do have midwives in Nova Scotia, but we don't have nearly enough midwives. 
Uh, and we know that midwife care is a proven uh, successful way for people to get primary uh, prenatal care. Uh, I think that there should be a massive investment in midwives in Nova Scotia. Every community should have one. Uh, when I was having my babies, I, there were like two <laughs> at the IWK. There was a list as long as my arm, and so I, you know, never got the chance to have access. But in the end, because my primary care provider didn't deliver babies, I ended up with two health, very healthy pregnancies going to the OBJ, like the perinatal clinic, which must have been like way more expensive than a midwife in terms of the cost on the system. And, uh, you know, it, mm, that was a fine experience for me, but probably totally unnecessary. Uh, so I just want to put that out there. I think midwives is a really important thing. Secondly, I just wanted to add <laughs> to the like holistic conversation in terms of uh, food programs, school food programs, uh, participation. I know doc, speaking of robotics, Dr. Mi Dr. Michael Dunbar was talking about wanting to bring participation back to Nova yes. Scotia, and I think it's a really good idea. Um, but I'm going to say, I'm going to put my, pl my, my plug in too for the place where, where uh, health, environment, and uh, sport and recreation intersect is in active transportation. <laughs> and so I think whenever we build a road in Nova Scotia, there should be a bike lane next to it. So the people aren't killed by wanting to ride their bikes. So that they, it's like an offset bike lane. They could also roll or use their scooters or whatever people are using for their mobile transportation. We should not be spending money on roads if we're not going to also put that aspect in. Imagine being able to commute from St. Margaret's Bay. Imagine being able to commute from Bedford on, on bike lanes. It would be amazing. And people would stay out of the hospital with cardiac problems. Thank you. I will tell you, they have a, a lot of bike lanes in Denmark. Exactly. It is a very, it is a very active uh, uh, country in terms of walking and bikes and so forth. And the Netherlands. Yes, and the Netherlands generally. Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much. Oh. Yeah. Time for one more. One more. One more. Okay. Oh, you need a, we need you to have a mic so that we can hear it when it's recorded. <laughs> thank you. I don't know if I have to. Oh, it's okay. on. It's on? Yep. I want to talk on behalf of the family doctors that are out there working now. Because everyone is kind of talking about what we're going to do, what we... But there are doctors out there. I run a medical practice of nine doctors, two, two surgeons. One of them has a list for screening colonoscopies, about 900. They're never going to happen. I'm telling you, he's going to retire before he ever gets to that number because it keeps growing. That's just one of the surgeons. And I have seven GPs, and they're exhausted. They're exhausted from what's been going on the last couple of years. My staff are exhausted. And I have wonderful staff, but they're being abused. Not by the system. They're being abused by the patients. We are booked. We have, each doctor has eight, at least eight to ten same-day urgents every day. We do a duty clinic Monday through Thursday. We were involved in the UCC program, and I'm telling you, those appointments are gone by 9 in the morning. And there's nothing we can do about it. We're squeezing patients in right, left, and center. We've got mothers calling at 3.30 in the afternoon with children with fevers, and we can't do anything. So I want to stand up for them. I want people to understand that the doctors that are out there that are working are working the hardest that they can, and they seem to be getting no appreciation. I'm sorry, I had to say it before everyone left. <laughs> well, <laughs> let's end on the claps, shall we? And, okay. thank you, and thank you for the comment. So thank you all very, very much for coming and, and uh, for asking these questions. And, and I know that whenever we have these conversations, my final comment is always how amazed I am both by the community engagement and by the leadership to come up and answer questions from the community. So thank you to those of you that have asked questions. And again, if you had questions that you didn't get answered, please submit your cards to us. Um, I do, ha and, and to whoever the person was that sent the card in, please see me so we can get your contact information. And, um, and safe travels home. Thanks so much for attending.